it's all very obvious. It all makes so much sense. For a certain generation of Slavists and older, the great kind of fears and traumas were experiences of repression and terrors. Um, for a generation, you know, just, just younger, what we can never get over is privatization in the 90s. For me, it's the um, civil war and genocidal breakdown of the former Yugoslavia, unimaginable at the time. So our traumas are completely different. Hello everyone, this is Scholarly Zeitgeist. It's spring and we are ready to wow you with new content. Um, this is Tanya Fremo from the Harriman uh, Institute at Columbia University. And I'm here with Mark Lipavieski, professor of Slavic languages and literatures, he also here at, uh, at Columbia. And today we're joined by Marieta Bozovic, who is a full professor in Slavic languages and literatures, also affiliated with film and media studies and women, gender, and sexuality studies at Yale. She is our, arguably the most famous Marietta of the Slavic world, our overtaking even our, the our queen of the political left, Marietta Shigenyan, and Marietta recently, <laughs> all of the Mariettas. <laughs> and today we are going to be talking about her exciting new book, Avant-Garde Post, Radical Poetics After the Soviet Union, that has just come out out of the Harvard University Press, as well as many other things. Welcome, Marietta. Thank you so much, both of you. <laughs> Hello, Marietta, and thank you for, for joining us. Uh, Marietta, we, we are running this uh, podcast uh, to ask our colleagues questions about what can be done, what should be done, uh, with our field uh, in the time of, uh, or after, hopefully, the time of Russia's invasion of uh, Ukraine. So how this historical uh, tragedy changed the field and uh, what are the new questions that we have to approach. You have been um, deeply involved into the sort of newly shaped regional studies, right? So Danube uh, region, uh, Black Sea, together with, with, with Columbia University uh, Network. Uh, and uh, this approach seems to be um, changing the, the, the traditional mapping of Slavic studies because, of course, it goes uh, against or beyond linguistic or political borders, right? Do you think that this approach might be a way to address uh, the challenges that, that the new situation creates. Mm, thank you for that question. It's in incredibly important at this moment. In some ways, I think that the, the war in Ukraine and the situation the last two years is pushing our field to do something that it should have done three decades ago. Mm -hmm. uh, American Slavic studies in particular coalesced as studies of the Soviet enemy, so Soviet Moscow and her sphere of influence. Um, there's, of course, an implicit um, reification of existing um, uh, imperial models in this, in this mode of study itself. I don't think there's a single solution as to what can be done to decolonize or expand. I think that different institutions are dramatically different beasts with different strengths. So I think what we should do, what we can be doing, and again, what we are trying to do, for example, at Yale Slavic, is look and see what are the local possibilities. Um, look and see what's afforded by the already existing Slavic program. See what lines we have available. See what collaborations we have possible. What half lines we might have. Think about what the other local strengths are. So, for example, the Daniel Project um, came about um, from a collaboration of a group of faculty at Colgate University, which was my my first job uh, out of graduate school. And there weren't very many people in the in Russian studies at Colgate, but it turned out there were amazing Germanists there. 
and specifically a few people working on Austrian. So again, that afforded a particular opportunity to do something really interesting, local, that expanded on our on our fields of knowledge. Places with resources like the Harriman Center, incredible area studies, social sciences colleagues can do something very exciting with projects like Black Sea Studies. So I think more than anything, I would urge us to be maximally flexible, uh, opportunistic in the best of ways, and push away from um, not not tradition per se, but a sense of policing the boundaries of our field. Institutional structure. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. So, so, so basically, uh, if I understand yeah. it correctly, right, um, you're talking about uh, the model that is uh, more or less project-based, right? So, so creation of uh, mobile projects, so creating projects that, that have their their networks that connect different departments, that connect uh, different, uh, you know, disciplines, right? Um, and, um, but but these projects, of course, they, they would define uh, scholarship mainly, right? And may, may define uh, graduate studies, right? Um, of course, uh, the, the the question arises: so where will be place will be placed where will be hired the the graduate students after working within these projects? There, so, so on the one hand, the interdisciplinarity is strength. On the other hand, not all departments will be following this uh, approach, right? But your your department, as we know, have. Uh, has already been sort of developing in this direction, and um, its offerings uh, include uh, courses that Slavic departments typically do not offer, right? So, so uh, courses on uh, Central Asia, right? Several courses, right? Russian and Chinese science fiction, material culture, uh, decorative art. I, I'm just curious, who among undergraduate students? are taking these courses. Mm -hmm. Who are them? Are they uh, Slavic majors? Are they, you know, complete, uh, majors. complete majors? Are they coming from art history, from history? So how, how is the population mm -hmm. of these courses formed? Again, a great and important question. I think we have very different responsibilities when it comes to undergraduate education and graduate education. Mm -hmm. For many of us, not all, there are some liberal arts colleges who primarily teach their, their Slavic, Slavic, Russian, Eurasian, East European courses, whatever, whatever it may be, two majors. But the vast majority of us, especially at the institutions that we are in, are teaching undergraduates, these are classes in translation, their broad interest, um, taught to, cor to students who might be taking one or two let's say, courses in Russian literature, period. In some cases, these are students who are taking one to two humanities courses, period. Uh, and again, it's a very different responsibility. With these students, we are trying to teach something about the region, teach something important about critical thinking, perhaps um, something about living in historical time, uh, a sense of the interconnection of aesthetics and politics. So again, you know, we're not trying remotely to replicate ourselves or give some kind of comprehensive coverage. In terms of enrollments, um, I would say that we have seen wonderful enrollments in some courses that seem fairly classical. Again, War and Peace, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Yeah, that's not surprising. That's, that's um, what happens everywhere. Um, but... Uh, the courses on Putin's Russia and protest culture mm -hmm. um, hit maximum enrollment the first yeah. day. Mm -hmm. um, a course that I co-taught with the wonderful um, graduate student Spencer Small, who's completing his PhD this year on war games, it filled within two minutes of being offered. Uh, so uh, Russian and Chinese science fiction, extremely popular. Mm -hmm. Again, brilliant colleague of mine, Jin Yi Chu, is offering a course called Against the West, looking at Chinese and Russian imaginaries of the, the West as enemy. Again, filled like Excellent. this. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I think we shouldn't underestimate undergraduates. I'm not seeing a dramatic division between, again, as you had said earlier, more <laughs> classical or canonical material and and others. Um, again, I think the the topics that s undergraduate students tend to be more interested in, and maybe this is a better way of thinking about it than canon, is the big global exports 
coming from Russia, Eastern Europe. Um, so, sure, this will always be Tolstoy. It will also always be Stravinsky and Skrabin and ballet um, and Soviet cinema of the 20s and 30s, uh, increasingly a kind of protest dissident culture in terms of the contemporary moment. And again, as I discovered teaching this experimental course, video games. Yeah, yeah the, 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 this sounds about right. Mm -hmm. uh, what about grade education, grade classes? Uh, so. I understand, of course, that, that, that you're offering, again, staple classes in for, for, for any graduate program in, 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 in Slavic studies, but what are the innovations or maybe directions for innovations that you would like to explore? Mm -hmm. This is, I think, the, the most critical question facing us, and it is not an easy question. Uh, on the one hand, we are seeing students coming in with incredibly diverse intellectual interests incredible projects, incredible questions. And this is this is very important to me. This is crucial to me uh, in terms of research production. For that, I genuinely believe that we should be encouraging open question, open problem uh, approaches, meaning uh, having students think, what bothers them, fascinates them, do they find most critical, um, and looking at that, asking, again, the biggest possible, most important questions about it, and then saying, okay, what can I contribute to it? I think one of the, the answers to the big open problem questions is collaboration. Um, again, when I worked on the Danube project, I worked with Germanists um, who could bring something totally different to the study of Vienna than I could. Um, I might be thinking of, let's say, contemporary Vienna and its post-Yugoslav diasporas, and I can see something they can't see, but if we put the two together, suddenly something far more exciting mm -hmm. um, emerges. And I cannot but think that these kinds of research projects will generate phenomenal um, pedagogical possibilities, more exciting courses, more student enthusiasm, more public attention, et cetera, than also more administrative resources, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the practicality. The practicality is how do we um, work within the existing job market, which I do think is changing more than we realize. Um, but again, academia moves slowly. Slow. So the graduate students innovate faster than some of these uh, departments that are ready to receive them might be innovating themselves. That's a very real problem. The second problem um, is this issue of collaboration, that in the humanities, we are not used to working with co-written material, for example. When it comes to tenure cases, uh, co-written material is suspect in, in, in some institutions, not all. But I admit it's a very real question um, in terms of, you know, what do we, how do we prepare students for both the present that is facing them and the future we want? <laughs> I think if we focus too much on the present and especially our fears about the present, we are doing them, them the field, the world a disservice. Um, so again, I feel like the, the response is maximum flexibility um, and some degree of specialization in certain areas, subfields, and perhaps nodes from university to university so that we're not replicating each other's yeah. graduate education structures. Right. You're, you're absolutely right. But let's talk about your scholarship. Um, I feel like, yes, they kind of are challenges that this, the discipline uh, faces, they do not necessarily are only contained at the structural level. Um, we also continuously ask ourselves how we um, approach scholarship at this moment uh, and whether we need to kind of like reconfigure our lenses in various ways. And for many of us uh, studying Russophone culture right now, um, in the aftermath of the full-scale invasion, uh, the question of uh, critique as an instrument um, has been associated with um, some anxiety, um, because on the one hand, it feels like um, if anything else, we should have been doing much more critique than we did previously, and we need to be very critical about uh, not impl uh, employing enough critique. On the, un on the other hand, though, um, contemporary critical theory uh, mm -hmm. has been moving into the direction of questioning um, of whether or not critique is um, a sufficient instrument that can yield productive change um, in general. Mm -hmm. And there has been research concerned with decentering critique as the major 
tool of analysis arguing for something that Pamela Fraser, for instance, calls a reparative reading, um, a methodology which would be drawing on um, Mm, insights from queer theory and object-oriented ontology. So I'm curious about your method in your new book because you right away introduce to your reader the idea of um, what you call sympathetic reading. Um, so I'm curious about how you approach your material that is contemporary Russophone poetry uh, from the perspective of um, a sympathetic reading, what it means to you, what it inspired you, and whether it gives you hope to produce research uh, on Russophon, contemporary Russophon culture at this moment. Um, thank you so much, Tanya. That's a wonderful question. Um, I should say, first off the bat, that some of the discourse around post-theory um, after critical theory um, is very distant to me uh, um, uh, because I feel like what gets limbed and lumped together with that is really a kind of um, reaction or um, pushing away of critical theory as such. And the pushing away of critical theory makes me very, very nervous. <laughs> um, so uh, critical theory is very, very central to me, um, to, to how I think, um, how I approach um, text and material. Um, uh, you know, perhaps to, to how my mind works at this at this point, and some of the, uh, the approaches and fields you mentioned, such as um, queer queer studies, um, have been really influential for me. Others like object or oriented ontology, you know, at times, but with again a, um, a good degree of reservation. Um, in fact, one of the protagonists of my recent book, Dmitry Golinka, wrote, I think it was 2014, 2015, against this kind of uh, materialistic uh, new materialism of various forms um, uh, in critical studies um, and really linked it to a reactionary political moment and a moment of withdrawal, which also you know, maybe, maybe is necessary and a necessary dialectical turn for survival. In terms of my, my own project, basically I would say that um, approach and methods to me seem to necessarily um, need to change from project to project, kind of big open question to big open question. What I wanted to do with this book was very specifically a kind of um, project of amplification. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in other contexts, you know, Fred Moten. I would also mention the scholar Walt Hunter, who works on English language poetry primarily and the book Global Forms. These also have, you know, elements of this amplification project. And again, uh, this itself is a kind of reaction to. Mm -hmm. um, I very specifically wanted to react to a mode of reading Russian language poetry mm -hmm. that was um, that has been prevalent in American academic American Slavic literary studies, um, and do something different from that. At the same time, that I wanted to. Um, Take, uh, take an approach, again, that's theoretically inspired. Um, you know, I mentioned um, Bloch in my, my introduction, uh, the principle of hope, and um, see what happens if we read through this kind of lens rather than the Jamesonian lens where the, let's say, subject, the plot line of each poem or narrative or sub-narrative turns to be the paradoxical means and anguish of its of its means of production. In short, taking a step back and perhaps simplifying what I just said, uh, certain critical hermeneutics of suspicion approaches when projected on certain material seem to me too obvious to be interesting. For example, my first book is not a feminist critique of Nabokov, because what would be remotely interesting in doing a feminist critique of Nabokov? But frankly, I'm more interested in some recent work that tries to to take a, the opposite um, approach and say, look, you know, Nabokov is not a misogynist. Um, and then we get something something interesting. So again, I thought that, let me give an example of, you know, what I don't want to do next mm -hmm. is I personally don't want to be studying um, certain cultural productions coming out of Russia at the moment and making the argument that they are nationalist. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Because it's so obvious. It's right? so obvious, yeah. right. But if we could read for little bits of emancipatory slippage in, let's say, journalistic coverage, then that becomes exciting. Uh -huh. Yeah. When you, when you say amplification, do you mean basically the goal of putting the spotlight on a specific group of poets? Um, because what, you, what else are, and I think what your book is doing in a very interesting theoretical way is actually um, not necessarily restricting us to this one uh, 
case study uh, in post-Soviet lyric, but other, but rather um, encouraging us to think about lyric as a form. What do you gain by amplifying um, a specific group uh, when you are, are making a larger theoretical argument about the possibility of um, the lyric to be um, a transgressive uh, mode and uh, genre of itself? You're right. I wanted to ask pretty big questions about is it, what does a new left look like after state socialism in Russia, but of course with that applicability elsewhere, and with echoes of what does a new left look like, period, um, uh, in the 21st century and the kind of current geopolitical moment, at the same time that I was really interested in thinking about the political possibilities of poetry in our, again, resurgent in our moment. Um, but in order to do that, I wanted to focus in on a case study that I understood really, really well. Mm -hmm. Returning to the amplification um, question, this is something that, let's say, you know, revisionist uh, feminist historical work does all the time. Of um, rather than focus in on specific individuals who everyone returns to time and time again, rather than writing, let's say, you know, um, uh, my next book on Sadokin, um, uh, why not um, try to bring to attention? Uh, figures that are maybe less widely known, um, but that provide really interesting case studies and could be, in fact, uh, readily teachable um, once we have translations, once we have PDFable um, PDFs of chapters and articles that we can assign. Um, and this is also, I would say, that my my experiences teaching at a couple different institutions have changed and shaped how I write as mm -hmm. well, where I try to think of specific specific audiences, specific readers, specific purposes. Mm -hmm. um, yes, but also about the scholar as a curator, because uh, so much of your um, um, book has come out uh, of the very curatorial project of bringing these poets um, for translation workshops or poetry readings and discussions. So it's, uh, it's like curating our uh, this content for posterity now um, uh, with um, with a, an interesting theoretical uh, observation about the form. Um, it's a very exciting book. So I think, you know, whenever we teach, whenever we create a syllabus, uh, John Guillory, cultural capital, whenever we teach a syllabus, we are creating some kind of temporary or perhaps longer lasting canon. We are saying, read this and, you know, do not read this. I remember uh, John McKay and I at some point after the Balabanov um, retrospective thinking, good Lord, why didn't we do one on Muratova? <laughs> 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 uh, because there was a response. There was a St. Petersburg-based conference mm -hmm. on Balabanov that used in its call for applications the, the kind of excuse that there was a retrospective at MoMA and then this retrospective at Yale, and boom, you know, there's your participation in canonization. Mm -hmm. So might as well do it consciously. <laughs> right. Uh, I think that, that your book is, so, sort of on the one hand, it is more or less um, expected approach within comparative literature, within global studies of avant-garde, and so nobody, nobody is, is surprised, and it is very effective uh, sort of bringing in uh, Russophone material into this framework. On the other hand, if we are looking from the side of Russian studies, uh, per se, it is, it is a pretty um, daring book because you are openly uh, connecting poetics with politics. Right, and uh, these connections have been very much stigmatized uh, since uh, since uh, Soviet period, right? Because it, the Soviet period was exactly uh, famous by direct politicizing of, of, of political of political word, right, and interpreting it as the manifestation of political views, right? And uh, the, the the entire generation of our teachers uh, focused on modernist literature, modernist poetry, they were sort of teaching us how to uh, distance from, from political agenda and how to put it aside and look at the independent politics of the form. You are sort of saying these are left poets, they are not only poets but, uh, but thinkers, political activists, um, and their poetry is a very important part of their entire entire life project, so to speak. Right? Do you feel that, that this approach is 
necessary again for 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 our field and that it will sort of uh, will will allow us to get rid of stereotypes uh, and and um, already not not operational approaches that sort of are present and uh, restraining us well, there, there are so many uh, threads there uh, in your question. I'll, I'll try to address a few of them. First, in terms of thinking of the, the apolitical ideal of uh, a certain generation or a few generations, I'm reminded actually of something that Sorokin said in an interview after the publication of Dina Prichnika, where he said, Ah, uh, you know, my my uh, generation had always prized itself on being the the apolitical, um, you know, artistic um, avant-garde, <laughs> um, uh, and our ideal was also always, you know, that Picasso drawing an apple yeah. as you know German forces um, pour Paris. pour into Paris. Yeah. And then he said, however, at some point, even he snapped and decided to take on his civic duty with Daniel Prichnika. You know, the first thing that I would say um, is for me, like, of course, there is no position outside of the political, broadly understood. Um, so there is no apolitical <laughs> scholarly stance. Um, uh, one might be not explicit about it, um, or one might not even be aware of it, um, but there is no position outside of the political. And all the work, so much of the work coming out of American Slavic studies that was dissident studies you know, work on Solzhenitsyn to say that it's not, you know, politically informed um, would be would be laughable. Um, so it's differently politically informed. And this, you know, might, might connect to something something else that we're talking about, which is a kind of generational shift in our field. Um, uh, I think, you know, it all it's all very obvious. It all makes so much sense for a certain generation of Slavists and older the great kind of fears and traumas were either lived experiences of state socialist hypocrisy and um, reduced possibility, um, or in fact, real experiences of repression, or the stories of those repression and terrors. Um, for a generation, you know, just just younger, what we can never get over is privatization in the 90s. Um, uh, the poverty, the, the people, the pensioners who died of hunger. Um, you know, for me, it's the um, civil war and genocidal breakdown of the former Yugoslavia, unimaginable at the time. I will say that three or four days into the in, um, invasion of Ukraine, I felt such a physical paralysis um, for four days, and then maybe it was somewhere in the morning of the fourth day, I understood what it was. Um, it was deja vu. Um, uh, it was that it was a familiar feeling um, uh, of helplessness um, that was magnifying my my response. Um, so our traumas are completely different. Um, and in many ways, I feel like this is simply a natural expression of what are um, the primary uh, concerns, the big open, uh, open questions to my generation. Um, and perhaps, uh, you know, this is already evolving um, and changing in the work of those, those younger. Mm -hmm. uh, since you mentioned the generational dynamic, um, I was curious to ask you about uh, the new leftist perspectives in Reese. At the most recent ACES uh, convention in Philadelphia, the most uh, popular stream and the most well-attended stream um, was uh, socialism and barbarism. Uh, and uh, the, the audience of this stream founded a society that they call Black Sheep Society, which sees its goal and purpose in looking for new perspectives, decentering liberal narratives that have been uh, predominating in the description um, of the region and Cold War narratives. Um, it seems exciting to, to see our, this force our, organizing around this idea. And I was curious what you think about um, this as a new movement within um, Slavic studies and um, what you think uh, should be our, some of the our primary directions in which um, uh, we who are are uh, interested in pursuing this kind of research should be moving? Uh, should we organize more conferences or more panels or do work that is uh, 
um, public, uh, uh, publicly oriented in some way, and what would be the topics that it should be concerned with mostly. I'm, of course, incredibly thrilled at this um, phenomenon. Uh, of course, full disclosure, these are my, my closest friends <laughs> in the field. Um, so, of course, I am very, very thrilled and supportive. I mean, my, my prediction is that this will, again, given my somewhat grim predictions for the geopolitical um, state of affairs in the, the period to come, I think that these approaches and, and critique um, uh, will be more necessary than ever, perhaps not least for our psychological um, survival um, in a moment of, I expect, pretty terrifying political retreat. So we're going to need all the black sheep <laughs> parties <laughs> and conferences and intellectual socializing and affirming and supportive of each other's work to psychologically survive. Again, and I don't even just have in mind, let's say, national politics or the ongoing war in Ukraine, um, uh, the devastating to many of us kind of closure of um, possibilities of doing field research and archives in the Russian Federation. I mean, we are devastated as a field, not least to mention the return of the culture wars on American campuses, which, again, I predict are going to be brutal. In some cases, they have already been brutal. We are seeing presidents fired, doxing trucks, students traumatized in various ways. Um, the Supreme Court decision about affirmative action and admissions. So I think we should do everything that we can to support ourselves um, uh, in what I think is going to be a very difficult period ahead. Um, and we can enjoy these local moments of, of joy. Um, uh, <laughs> I think I think they're they're what we've got. Uh, longer term, my expectation is that this will become so part of the mainstream um, that it will be successful enough to disappear. <laughs> um, uh, that it will simply become a recognized set of approaches at ACs, at SEAL, other national conventions, um, and that we won't necessarily need to proclaim. Um, ourselves as theoretically minded um, or leftist. We just simply do that work. So what, what is your new book about? Ah. Uh, so there, there are a few things. Um, currently, I am co-writing a book with my, my brilliant co-author and collaborator, Ben Peters, the author of How Not to Network uh, a Nation, about why the Soviet Union um, did, failed to network. Um, the project is called Ima Imagining Russian Hackers, Myths of Men and Machines. Uh, and it's coming from one hand out of cultural studies, on the other from media history uh, and media theory. And it tries to examine the phenomenon of Russian hackers as something to be feared, um, with 2016 as its, as its epicenter, um, although we have the next election very much in mind. And it's roughly structured in, in halves, with the first half kind of looking at the West, the imagined West and its fictional, also media portrayal of Russian hackers, of headlines, of visual depictions, of um, uh, legal arguments, um, uh, also fiction, fiction film and television. How are Russian hackers imagined? Why are they a kind of perfect continuation of the Cold War enemy with an update um, for our time? What are they obfuscating? What are they standing in for? Uh, whereas the second part of the book tries to do a more intellectual, cultural history project, thinking about um, the very real phenomenon of IT talent flow from the late Soviet Union um, and post-Soviet context around the world. I, again, full disclosure, um, moved to the, the States with my family from the former Yugoslavia in the, the 80s, um, and we ended up in Silicon Valley, you know, Russophone Silicon uh, uh, Valley. And so this is, you know, very, very apparent, was very apparent to me in, in my own biography. So there's that project. Uh, next solo project is even weirder. <laughs> And it emerged from the, the pandemic. Uh, as I was starting to think about this next project um, and Russian hackers and late Soviet or late state socialist DIY culture, thinking about how, you know, why is it that every man, my, my father's generation, um, uh, can make a radio out of a tin can and a fork? And I was thinking, 
what are the women doing? As I was asking myself this question, I was sort of realizing that I was nervously sewing something, a dress that my daughter had torn. And I thought, wait, I know exactly what the women are doing. So I started thinking about the fact that, again, scratch the surface of uh, you know, nearly any woman who is a teenager in the state socialist 80s or older, and everybody was sewing. Everybody was making clothes. Um, uh, this connects with to. yes, yes. Um, uh, this connects with various dissident subcultures. Let's say queer subcultures in the former Yugoslavia or um, uh, Soviet hippies. And we're wearing bell bottoms. Who are styling themselves after after the Beatles? Um, uh, I started digging into this and also specifically thinking about sewing patterns as, as a media object and realizing how interesting and still understudied it is, again, for, for fairly obvious reasons. Uh, in our regional context, so understudied, but so interesting. Uh, you know, we have historical avant-garde costuming and patterns, you know, Gancherova, um, you know, those those have been Stefano. studied, yes. Um, uh, but, you know, what about more work done on, let's say, military uniforms? Um, again, dissident cultures, um, the late Soviet, post-Soviet moment. One last question is about the advice for the younger scholars. I think, especially younger scholars, myself included, we see you as uh, an embodiment of this idea of a universal scholar because of how diverse your interests are. Um, you're an book of scholar, you work on gender, you work on contemporary things, the internet, uh, so many things. Um, so you're also very uh, involved in uh, advising um, graduate students uh, as an advisor and uh, as a DGS. What is uh, your general advice for somebody who is uh, starting an academic career right now? Uh, what should um, a student of uh, Slavic studies be paying attention more to at this moment? Should it be um, diversifying our linguistic competences, or trying to work and maximize our possibilities of working in different fields, or, or something else? Uh, such an important question. It takes about 10 years to write a book. Um, you know, what can you stand to work on for 10 years that is truly important enough to you that you care enough about that you want to come back to the desk to the project every morning you know it has to it has to begin with something that matters and is worth writing about to you otherwise none of it makes any sense um uh so i think that that is is key i'll say something that my my dear colleague nari shalikpayev uh, asked when, when joining the Yale Slavic program, asking about our graduate program, he asked, um, he, he put it this way, something like, what are you doing to make sure that you're helping to produce and promote world-class intellectuals? And that question really kind of put me to shame. Uh, many of our faculty meetings were about coverage, were about, you know, professionalization, about, um, uh, you know, using AV in a, in a pleasant way for conferences. And here, you know, Nadi was saying, what, what about what really matters? <laughs> what we're really supposed to be doing this for? So I think we have to, we have to emphasize that. And I think, so, you know, erudition. Um, as much erudition and learning and education, especially in the earlier years of the graduate program, but ideally throughout and forever after as possible. And then in terms of how I think this can converge with practical concerns is maximal flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I think bigger picture thinkers, erudite, self-aware, Schol young scholars will be able to navigate different kinds of environments. Um, the field that I, you know, as, as we've been discussing this entire session, the field that we find ourselves in now is totally unrecognizable in some ways from 20 years ago uh, and is, again, unrecognizable from uh, where it was when I was starting graduate school in 2003. So, you know, if we purposefully or accidentally create some replicas of ourselves, we're actually, I think, doing them a practical disservice too. Oh, yeah. Then they land somewhere that's totally different, a historically black college. Now, you know, find a way of teaching Tolstoy um, that will bring in student publics. Yeah, so we shouldn't be thinking about the present, we should be thinking about the future.
Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much for this conversation, Maria. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you, both of you. Absolutely. I'm really glad you're doing this podcast project. You are thinking about the future as well. <laughs> so we're really grateful for it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.